Spirit. Josh, thank you so much for the invitation of being here today. We're having a little technical glitch, uh, so Cody, will you may just have to follow me here uh, for a little bit. Uh, this is my family. Um, this is Jill. Uh, Jill and I have been married for 32 years, and on the right is Kristen. Uh, she is a PE teacher in Nashville, and on the left is Katie, and uh, she teaches third grade. They happen to teach at the same school, which is kind of a blessing. Um, uh, my wife teaches at, uh, at a place just 10 minutes from our house, uh, and the uh, Lord has brought us to Nashville, Tennessee for this season of life, which means that you get to see the uh, most important person in my life right now. I'll go ahead to the next one, Cody, because my iPad just uh, cut out on me. So this is uh, not Nate, my son-in-law. He's not the most important person in my life. Uh, they got married a couple of years ago. This is my brand new baby granddaughter. Her name is Evelyn Clara, and we'll go to the next slide so you can see her up close and personal. This is Ava. We call her Ava, and uh, I have Fridays off, which means in order uh, to help the kids financially or whatever, I get Ava on Friday. So it's Grandpa Day with Ava. And the first day, it had been a long time since I'd had a baby that I was responsible for. And when her mother got home from school that day, there were diapers everywhere in the house. There was for so much formula on the table, it looked like a drug deal had gone bad. <laughs> and I just handed her to her and I said, she's alive. <laughs> uh, and, and I'm struck with uh, the fact that uh, there are moms and there are dads who are single parents and I just want to tell you, you're my heroes right now because I'm, right now Ava has a team of six that is revolving into her life. And uh, what a joy it is to be here with you today to see all of the kids, uh, see all the babies. What a blessing from the Lord to have a church full of babies. There just came, babies came in. What a, what a great thing that is. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that today. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Don't turn in your Bibles because we won't stay there too long. Let's go to this next slide here. Um, this is how God intended for faith to be transferred from generation to generation through the family. The church is in partnership. You understand Ephesians chapter 4, but Deuteronomy 6, D6, is how faith is to be transferred from one generation to the next. And we are to impress upon our children the things of God. We are to... As we walk through our day, as we're eating lunch with them, we're to tell them about who Jesus is. And, and today, I'm going to talk about family a lot. And so maybe, maybe you're here and right now you don't have family around you. Or maybe you're, maybe you're a single mom or a single dad and you're saying, wait a minute, where's my team? Let, let me just tell you this. You and the Holy Spirit are a team. You and Christ are able to do it. And not only that, don't miss who your church family is in the middle of all of this. So even though God has ordained the family to be the one that we are to impress upon our children, it is working with the community of faith. And just a couple of remarks about that. I, I apologize that I'm not able to, to move this. Go ahead, Cody. Just hit the next couple here as we go through. You'll see why this uh, proper worship is. Hit the next three as we go through here. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That's not news to you today, is it? You know this. I mean, you've heard this passage before. You have been doing that this morning as we have worshipped how I have enjoyed. Man, being with people from Kansas, from the Midwest, it's nice. I'm in Nashville right now, which is like hipster village. You know, there's, uh, and I'd wear skinny jeans, but I can't get them over my depends. I mean, it just, um, <laughs> yeah. That's not, I stole that straight from Richard Ross, who's a lot older than me, but I did, I did wear something for you today. I'm wearing my official Kansas City Royal World Championship 19 socks right here. Kansas City, yeah? That's important for you to know because in a little while you're not going to like me with something I say. So, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Now, how does that work? Go, go to this next section here, Cody, as, as we go through. You're going to see a, a few things. It's a connection, it's a connection. You see, I am connected to Ava through Nate and through Kristen. But they're connected to Richard and Sandra Pointer, who live in Springfield, Missouri, eight, eight blocks behind Bass Pro Shop, my mom and dad's house. And they're connected to 
Clara and Robert Pickerelli in Nashville. But they're not only connected there, they're connected to great-grandparents. This is how the Lord connects us to our past. So when, when, when Moses says here that we are to love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, and mind, which every Jewish family recites every day, it's a reminder of who we're connected to. We're connected to our past. We're connected to our community. You see, not only is Ava connected to the pointer side of the family and the Piccarilli side and the Caudill side of the family, she's connected to a great cloud of witnesses of the churches, not only of the churches that she's in right now, but the churches that have influenced her parents and her grandparents in the past. It's a connection, this family of God that comes together. And we are to remind our students and we're to remind our kids that they don't stand alone. They stand on the shoulders of faithful men and women who have gone before them. It's a connection then for our children to understand that they are part of something bigger. So let's go on to this next, uh, this next slide here. Because I honestly don't remember what comes next. Okay, now I don't remember. Now we start the message. That was interesting. Don't you hate that? You thought we were going home, getting ready to head to the restaurant, right? In my town, we got to beat the Church of Christ to Logan's. That's just all you do. If you, as long as you beat the Church of Christ, then, then you got it, right? It has occurred to me, as I've spent my entire life in youth ministry, and I was not Moses' youth pastor. I was Joshua's, but I was not Moses's. I've been doing this a long time, that as we have talked about who children are and how important they are in our lives, that unfortunately we've developed what I call the cult of the kid. Now, now understand, I love kids. And you say, well, I'm not, I'm not cult of the kid. Let me just ask you this. If you're a mom or a dad, who controls your calendar? You see, in, in Nashville, there's some calendar controlling going on. I'm sure it's probably not true in Wichita, but you got a little, you got a little uh, superstar baseball player, and all of a sudden you find out he's on a travel team and he misses church on Sundays. Who's controlling the calendar? And you see, we've got an awful lot of parents who seem to say it's okay to their kids. You know, church is really important. Oh, but you might get a scholarship. And all of a sudden, do you see what happened? There's been a change in emphasis from the things of God to things that are okay and that are sometimes good, but they take control of the life. Hmm. It's a tough thing to say because when I preach this in Michigan, it's hockey teams. And when I, when I do this in Arkansas, it's cheerleader teams and soccer teams and, and all of these things. And we talk about the cult of the kid. Let's go to the next slide here. Here's a passage, Luke chapter 2, verse 52. By the way, all of you new parents and grandparents, pray this over your kids. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. We understand the wisdom part, don't we? I mean, we're pushing our kids for good grades, aren't we? The, ki- the students out here are going, yeah, man, I brought back home a bad grade. Well, shame on you. You're not going to find a shoulder. I'm a former fifth grade school teacher, okay? You need to know that that's in my past as well. We don't have a problem thinking about wisdom, and we don't have a problem stature-wise. I mean, we want our kids to be healthy, right? If there is something that is happening with our kids where they are sick, we're going to move heaven and earth, are we not, to try to do what we can for our kids. I mean, that's what parents do. These parts you don't have to hear. I want to talk to you about the secondary part. And in favor with God and man. Favor with God. Now, let me ask you. Is there anything that you would trade in your life for having favor with God? Is there anything you would trade in your life for your children to have favor with God? Or the children in this church have favor in God? Then don't let me look at your church budget, by the way, because I might find something (laughs) that trades it. Don't, don't tell me about all the travel places your kids go. You see that passage in, in, in Timothy bothers me. It says, for the love of money, men will wander away from the faith. That scares me. You know why? Because it means that we can be distracted to the point where we actually leave the faith. 
And we don't even realize we've taken steps that way. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and favor with God and man. I love this passage. I prayed it over my daughters. I pray that you will pray it over your kids and the kids here at this church. I believe it's a great passage. Let's go to the next. Go ahead. If you can move to the next one because I really don't remember what came next. So my notes are right here. Pleasing to God. Absolutely. Next one. Pleasing to man. Let's talk about those two. Pleasing to God. That's why you bring him to church. Pleasing to God. Because on that day, we want him to tell our kids, well done, good and faithful servant. But pleasing to man. Ooh, that's interesting. Let me, let me give you a little tidbit. Uh, when I taught fifth grade, there was a teacher across the hall from me. Her name was Sarah Coker, and this is what she said. You don't discipline your kids because you love them. You discipline your kids so others will love them. <laughs> wow. Man, that's good. <laughs> Pleasing to man. You know, I had a volleyball coach that was taking my daughter, and I realized that she was not saying, and, and by the way, I'm not one of these parents. Kristen was a, a solid volleyball player, a solid basketball player, but she knew she was going to be a teacher. She knew she was going to Welch College. They don't offer athletic scholarships. So people were like, you're that dad who's fighting for scholarships. No, I wasn't. I was the dad who was praying that my daughters would have favor with their volleyball coach, that their daughter would have favor with their English teacher in eighth grade, that as right now that their daughter, my daughters will have favor with the principals and with the other teachers. Why? Because that's their witness. We discipline our kids. We love our kids. There's not anyone here who doesn't love our kids. And sometimes we think that if we discipline them that we don't love them. That's not true. If we discipline our kids, we do that so others will love them. So they will be pleasing to man as well. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God which you hear all the time at church, and with man. Let's go to the next slide. Red flags. I want to throw some red flags on some parenting today. You see, I'm not a perfect parent, but I've been around a lot of parents. I know when good parenting happens and when it doesn't, and I've decided I think I'm going to open a parenting kiosk at Walmart. <laughs> You're doing it good. You not so much. I saw this. I saw this mom, this kid was just being an absolute brat, and the mom left the cart at Walmart, grabbed the kid by the arm, and said, we're going to the parking lot. I followed her. I was going. <laughs> you, you understand? Okay, so I think we're on the same flag here. So parenting red flags. By the way, this is where you won't like me so much, because I was going to say, and do we trust Andy Reid to challenge at the right time? And <laughs> I know what the answer is. All right, so here we go. Parenting red flag. Here's one. Cowering parents, where it is absolutely true that the child is in control of the household. That's not healthy, folks. When I was a fifth grade teacher, there was this student, and he wasn't trouble in my class, but he would not do what we asked him to do. I mean, he honestly would run away from any type of discipline, and he would circle the outside. I taught fifth grade. He would circle the outside of the school. And so we called a conference with his mom. We said, Mom, you got to get a hold of this child somehow. And she said, you don't understand. He hits me. Fifth grade. I said, man, that's awful. Here, this is my cell phone number. Next time that happens, call me. <laughs> now, I, I'm a little old school in approach, I understand. And you may, be some, you may have some educators that are here, and you need to understand my education philosophy. My education philosophy is not based on test results, and it's not based on academic progress, because I think that will take care of itself. I want my kids to love school. And to do that... They have to get along with everyone else. So I have, this, I have this standard here, okay? But when you're afraid of your own kids, that's, that's a problem. Second, covering parents. Parents who excuse their kids. Now, understand this. I have heard this excuse, and I've heard parents say, he's a good kid, he just fell in with the wrong crowd, 
You've heard that before? Okay. Can I let you in on a little insight? Someone's kid's the wrong crowd. It might be yours. You see, we, we need to learn how to read our kids before we can lead our kids. And if we know, oh, here, go, go to this. This is uh, the next one. In the 1960s, parents would yell at the kid if their grades were terrible. In the 2000s, they yell at the teacher if the kid's grades are terrible. When I was in kindergarten in Springfield, Missouri, my mom sent me to school, and she, as we were going, I needed a jacket. Well, I had this jacket, and the zipper would not work. She said, don't worry about it. Just go to school, wear your jacket. No lie, it was one of those days kindergarten teacher had had enough of the class. And she said, everyone, put on your jackets. No problem. Everyone, zip up or button your jackets. Problem. And enough kids had come up and whined to her, and she said, the next kid that I find that can't zip up his jacket is going to get a spanking. And I'm in the back of the class going, ah! trying to get this zipper up, right? She comes back and says, what is the problem? I said, the zipper's broke. Mom sent me to school with the wrong zipper again. Yeah. And she goes, if I can zip up this jacket, you're getting a swat. I'm like, yeah, you try it, sister. No lie. Zip. Turned me around, swatted me on the bottom. I head out of class to the 1968 green Impala station wagon that everyone drove during that time. Go up to my mom. She says, why are you crying? I said, I got spanked because my stupid jacket wouldn't zip up. And she goes, you know, I'm thinking, take on the teacher. She goes, I get in the car. You probably deserved it for something else anyway. Man, I cannot tell you, but that may have been the most valuable lesson I ever learned in kindergarten. That life was not fair, and that I had to adapt more than someone should be adapting to me. We don't want to give excuses. When we give too many excuses and too many bailouts, we create Students who are not able to stand on their own and don't understand the real aspect of life. Let's go to the next thing. You have, you have cowering parents. You have covering parents. You have confusing parents. These are the parents who begin dressing like their kids and talking like their kids and doing everything their kids are doing. Is that not just a little confusing to everyone? Mom? No. <laughs> it confuses the role. Next, next one, the uh, controlling parent, where the child can't do anything. By the way, these are based a lot from a, a, a guy I really follow. His name is Tim Elmore. He is an excellent person, uh, Generation IY and some other things. that We can make uh, some of those resources available for you to be able to look at online. But controlling parents, there are parents who control every aspect of their kids' lives. You know what we call them? We call them helicopter parents. There's many of you who are my age who remember being sent out of the house at about 7 a.m. in the morning by a mom who said, don't return <laughs> until dark, right? But there's very few of us who would do that today. And, and by the way, I'm not going to let it happen with Ava. We live in a different world, right? But now we've become so, it's like we need to put our kids in bubble wrap. You can be called for child abuse if your child climbs a tree and falls and hurts itself. We've got some things wrong. But it, as parents, we're doing some of it ourselves. One of the professors from Syracuse University said, in one of Tim Elmore's books, she said, I'm lecturing in class, and I hear a student say, hey, yeah, hold on, Mom, just a second. Interrupts, his, interrupts the lecture, hands the cell phone to the mom and says, my mom wants to talk to you, Professor, about my grade. Helicopter parents. How about these parents? Commando parents. <laughs> you're going to get up at 7 a.m. every morning. You're going to do 27,000 push-ups, and you're going to make A's. If you don't make A's, you're going to boot camp, you know. Which, by the way, there's some legitimacy to some of this, right? But you kind of you know. That's where grandparents come in, right? We figured out what grandparents are for. Grandparents have no pressure. 
They have no pressure. Ava, I mean, she's six months old. I'm buying her stuff. I'm like, I can't wait till I take her to the store. My, my daughter's looking at me like, who are you? I am grandfather. We figured it out. We don't have the, we don't have the pressure. To discipline. It was funny when Kristen was little, Kristen wrote on my parents' wall at the house in Springfield, Missouri, took out a pen or pencil and started writing on the wall. And my wife, oh, she's like, oh, my dad goes, don't touch that child. (laughs) Jill goes, but if I don't touch her, she'll write on my wall. And my dad says, well, then spank her then. But in my house, and I'm looking at him going, do you remember when I launched my sister down the hallway with a wiffle ball bat? Do you remember that? Do you remember that I remember hearing your footsteps come down the hall and I can still hear the belt coming out of the loops? (laughs) Do you remember that? You're not the same person. I'm not the same person. I am grandfather. Here, do you need some money? Sure. All right. I couldn't get a dollar to save my life. Now I'm like setting up college funds. I'll sell my car. Sure. You want it? Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Next one. Coddling. Oh boy. We don't even need to deal with this, right? Come here, honey. I had had a, a cousin who never got his own plate at family gatherings. He was 27. Yeah, we'll move to the next one. Before I get to these messages, um, some of us explode sometimes, don't we? So I, I want to let you parents know that it, there are times that it happens. We were on this trip. H- have you ever set up a vacation that in your mind it was going to be like the greatest trip in the world? Everyone was going to be singing songs, you know. We lived in Russellville, Arkansas, and we were on our way to Nashville for spring break. And we decided we were going to stop at the Memphis Zoo. After 2 o'clock on, on Mondays, they open up the Memphis Zoo, and you can go free. And I'm like, this is going to be the greatest vacation. My, my daughters are going to be singing my praises. They were like 4 and 2, something in that area, maybe, maybe 5 and 3. And it was a disaster. They wanted everything in the gift shop. Nothing was good. They were whiny. They were tired. We got in the car, and I am miffed. We get 20 miles outside of Nashville towards, or outside of Memphis on our way towards Nashville, and I have had it. I have had enough. I pull over to the side of the highway. I reach in, and I grab Kristen, and I pull her out of the car, and I give her a swat on the side of the highway there, and I put her back in. I'm like, no, you too, Katie, and I grab Katie and <laughs> gave her a little swat and put him back, and I'm fuming. I get back in the car, and it's really quiet, and about 10 miles down the road, I look at my wife, Jill, sitting next to me. I said, well, she said, I thought I was next. <laughs> Mm. I sent my 21-year-old to her room. 21. Go to your room. She went, okay. (laughs) And then I spent the next 10 minutes just venting. Have you ever done that? Or is it just, please, someone else? Yeah, maybe. Okay, good. I feel a little better. All right. So then when you mess up, you go and you sit on your kid's bed and you say, man, I'm sorry. That's not who I want to be. That's not what you deserve. Something else was going on in my life, and I took it out on you. You know what? We don't want to make a pattern of that, but when we mess up, and every parent is going to mess up, we become vulnerable with our kids at a certain age, and we let them know that we're trying to be more like Christ as well. So here's some messages they need to hear from us. Go, go through these. There's about five of them, Cody. You are loved. Our kids need to hear. You are unique. You have gifts. You are safe. You are valuable. Those are messages we need to give to our kids, right? But notice this next thing. Pull it up here, Cody. Up to eight or nine years of age. You see, as a fifth grade teacher, my job was to take them from their little elementary world and move them towards middle school. So the first semester, I was like teacher... Dad, second semester, I was 
teacher, coach. Because up to a certain age, these things are very valuable for our kids to understand. But after this, there's a few more statements that they need to understand. Let's do these one by one, Cody. This first one. They need to hear this. Life is difficult. (laughs) Second one. You are not in control. Third, you are not that important. (laughs) Now, understand, we've got our messages. We're still giving the same messages to when they're younger to our high school and college kids. Do you know that the statistics are saying right now that adulthood or adolescence, excuse me, is bumping adulthood back in age to now They're saying adolescence runs through age 27. That's not good. One of my friends, Richard Ross, who's in youth ministry, he just spoke a couple of uh, weeks ago at my church. Incredible, incredible guy. He has a book. It says, Accelerate, What to Teach Your Teen. And the the subtitle is, How Not to Have Your 25-Year-Old Living in Your Basement. Now, if you're a 25-year-old living in your parents' basement, we need to talk afterwards. I'm just going to send you to Jared, okay? So, you are not that... Why is that a message important? It's because the world does not revolve around us, does it? My boss doesn't like me. (laughs) I don't... I graduated from college, and my job doesn't pay me $75,000 a year? What happened? Because it's not about you. Okay, next one. You are going to die. Seems harsh, doesn't it? But which is more true to life? Life comes to an end. And we in the church understand that there's a tagline that goes to that, right? Life comes to an end, and after this is the judgment. We're preparing our kids to live eternally. You see, the number one goal of a parent is that they're preparing their kids to live with Jesus forever. That means we better live for Jesus now as well. It's on us. So let's, let's kind of wrap this thing up a little bit, uh, a couple of ideas here. Life is not about you. It's about Jesus. Let's go to the next one. So it's a change. How many of you use, uh, use some type of GPS device, whether on your phone or whatever? How many of you, when you type it in where you're going, that's now the time to beat? <laughs> you're like, 821? I don't think so. <laughs> younger kids. Younger kids were GPS parents. Step by step. Helping them to navigate through life. But this is a picture for when they become adolescents and as they head into it. It's a compass and a guidebook. They may make some decisions that we don't agree with, but if they come back and they say, Mom, I've been thinking seriously that if I trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean on my, on my own understanding, and if in all my ways I acknowledge Him that He will direct my path, then, Mom, I need to tell you something. This college scholarship... I think God is wanting me to go to a Christian school because God has told me that he wants me to be a missionary. Now, listen, I I told you before I'm in a season of life. I'm in a season of life where both of my daughters live within eight minutes of me and my grandbaby I get to see almost every day. I understand how blessed I am at this. But you need to understand that I've been praying since the girls were little that the Lord would send them wherever they needed to go. So let's play a scenario here. Your parent, your, your parent, your student has graduated from college. They're living here, and they call you in one day, and they say, hey, Mom, Dad, I need to let you know something. I've been, I've been offered a job in California. They're going to double my pay. Almost all of us would say, oh, man, that's a great opportunity. I I don't know that you could turn that down. 
and we would send them off with our blessings. Same kid comes after college and they say, the Lord has been putting unreached people groups on my, on my heart and the Lord is calling me to go and he wants me to go to one of the stands, the country that ends in stand where they don't like Christians. Now, honey, you know you can serve Jesus right here in Wichita. <laughs> right? You know our church needs Sunday school teachers. Why don't, you, why don't you think about it a little bit more? What's the difference, folks? The difference is in us and where our heart is. Their treasure might be. So, let's go. Here we go. Number one. Parenting points. Number one. Someone has to be in charge. It might as well be you. <laughs> might as well be you. Number two. Expect difficulties. <laughs> My daughter in formula is about to drive her crazy. <laughs> Do you remember when we got done with formula? Yes. Do you remember when we got done with diapers? Oh, yes. Praise Jesus. Do you remember when we got done with car seats? Hallelujah, right? But it's difficult. Titus 2, it says the older women are to help train the younger women. Tell them the truth, older women. <laughs> and tell them they're not alone. By the way, there's not really an injunction to the dads during that. It's assumed from the book of Titus that the dads are doing that. It's worse on the dads than it is on the women at that point, by the way, what they're being held to. Expect difficulties. Three, anticipate seasons. Oh, I love this. How was it growing with your kids? You know, as I look back now, I mean, Kristen's 27 and a mom, and Katie is, Katie bought a, half of a duplex this year on her own. I'm like, wow, can I come live there? It's nicer than where I live. What season did you enjoy the most of your kids? If you ask moms, they're like, oh, I loved it when they were little and you could just squeeze their cheeks. And, or I, I liked it when we got the little dresses for them, you know, and dads are like, I liked it when they left home. <laughs> By the way, moms, there's a lot, there's a lot of pressure on you. And I, and I want to illustrate it this way, okay? Moms, when your child messes up, you take it personally. You're like, I messed up as a parent. I didn't do something that should have, my, my, my kids should have made a better choice. Dads, when your kids mess up, this is what we say. My kid's a moron. We don't take it as personally, and we don't understand, right? I mean, our wives are like, oh, I, you know, I didn't toilet train him correctly. Where'd that come from? But we've had those types of conversations, but anticipate seasons. I promise you that right now, at the age I am, at age 53, and I'm looking back and I'm looking at my daughters, my daughter, or my granddaughter now, Chris, uh, Ava, will do something, and Jill will say, don't you remember when Kristen used to do that? And I'm like, yeah. No. I don't remember. I just don't. Fourth and last, we're to make our homes an embassy. Now, understand what I'm talking about here. We're not building family compounds to protect our kids. That's not what we're supposed to do as Christians. You see, earlier, I, I made that statement. We discipline our kids so that others will love them. I left off one phrase, and they're Jesus. We spent Truth and Peace weekend talking about letting your yes be yes, your no be no, living lives of integrity, honesty, building character, honor in our lives. We raise our kids not so that we can hold on to them, but so that we can open them up to the world as ambassadors for Jesus Christ. You see, that's what embassies are. Embassies are safe places. I was in Russia, and my friend Brad Sneed lost his visa, not his credit card, his actual documentation that allowed him to be in the country. I left the country. Brad had to go to the U.S. Embassy, and when he stepped inside the U.S. Embassy, he was on American soil. He was protected. Parents, grandparents, church members, we want our homes, we want our church to be a safe place. 
when they come home, they're home. But we want them to be functioning as an embassy. We want them to be sent out as representatives. That's what Paul said to the church at Corinth. You are ambassadors for Christ. You represent me in this world. That's why Sunday morning loving on our kids is so important. It's why we will spend budget money to take them to camp and to conferences and to host them here on, on, on campus. I love the, what I hear about Wednesday nights that you reach out into the neighborhood and, and you make sure that they are fed and that they're loved. We bring kids in so that they're loved, but we don't bring them in to make them entitled. We bring them in so that they will be ambassadors for Christ so that they are so secure with who they are, that their identity is so tied up in Christ, that they then go into the world and represent Jesus.